Here we are in Gedlin with British featherweight champion, Mr. Lee Wood. Lee, how you doing? Good mate, all good. Bit emotional back here where it all, where it all started. <laughs> Just going to say that, back to your roots again, but now you're the British champion. Um, just talk to me about how it all began. I mean, the story behind you entering the Phoenix gym and, and sort of getting into boxing in the first place. What inspired you to, to step through the ropes? It was a long time ago. Um, I came down here with my brother and his friends. They was all a bit older than me. We used to do other things to go, you know, we used to climb trees and blah, blah, blah. And um, one time it was boxing, so we all came boxing. And my friend's mum used to take us, he lived on my road, um, come down a few times and then my brother didn't go one day, so I walked up the road, knocked on his door, and um, his mum came to the door and was like, you're right, it's like, we're going boxing. She's like, oh, he's, he's not going anymore. He's doing something else, I don't know, he's collecting pogs or something, I can't remember what <laughs> he was doing. Come on, there's always something. And I said, oh, I said, oh, all right. Um, so I turned around, started walking down the path, and she's like, do you want a lift? I was like, yeah, if you don't mind. So then she started taking me for a few months, and then um, Mark Anderson, he lived on my street, he started coaching here. So I used to come down with him, and yeah, I just used to come down a few times a week, Sunday morning, seeing Frotch train with, um, at the time, a really good set of lads like Lee Morris, Ricardo Sams, Jason Yarnell, all of them just grafted in the morning. I was only 10 years old, probably. I was thinking, fucking hell, like animals. But yeah, just boxing's one of the things that just um, it captivates you. And it's hard, such hard sport. So when you do something, when you achieve something and do well in a hard sport, it's a lot more rewarding than uh, other team sports, I think, personally. How does it feel to be back here as, as British champion after all those years, those, <laughs> those ups and downs and you know, the rise and fall, and now British champion and looking to move on to sort of bigger things? It feels good, it feels good. Obviously, I don't want to look back and, and stand here and look back too much and dwell too much because I've still got a lot further to go, but um, it's nice to come back. I've got a lot of memories here. Just walking in straight away just triggers all these memories from that side of the gym and the circuits are exactly the same. That padded thing with the silks on, so exactly the same colours and yeah, it's, um, it's nice to have a lot of memories here. Obviously, my first fights and I was 10 years in amateur here, so mm. yeah, so many men memories and, and spars. It used to be a bigger ring. I couldn't even get up. It was up to my chin at the time. Someone sent me a video of my friend sparring the other day. Uh, I think it was Liam Morris and Michael Boylan sparring. And if you zoom in, you can see me shadow boxing over there with a string vest on. I must have been 10 years old. And that's the earliest video I've got of myself in this gym. So yeah, very special to be back. And another champion, Mr. Carl Froch, used to train here quite a bit. Um, back to his roots as well. Um, how inspirational was Carl Froch on your sort of rise to glory? Massive. Massive. I used to train here Sunday mornings when Carl was here. I think there was a different night at the time, adults night, like senior carded lads and then uh, beginners come in a bit earlier, I think it was, so you could see him coming in as we was going. But Sunday morning, everyone trained together. So um, Sunday morning, used to see him training really hard. And then one Sunday morning, Mark brought me in and Carl just finished and he said, get his autograph. And I'd seen him for months and months, maybe a year. And um, I was thinking, why, what, what's, what's like, who is he like? And he said, oh, he's just come back from the Worlds and he's, he's won a medal. And Carl was just like, not really used to signing things. So Carl was a bit looking a bit like, uh, uh. so then he signed, a, he signed an old club ticket for me on the back. I've still got it somewhere in my loft. Um, I think that was the first time like, Carl had a bit of success. Obviously he won the ABAs, first person to win a medal at the Worlds and then, um, Obviously, he went on. I went to all of his pro fights, watched him win British, Commonwealth, everything else. Uh, world title at the arena. Um, I've been to nearly all his fights. It's such an inspiration for someone like that on my doorstep from the same village, went to the same school, same amateur club to go and conquer the world. You can't ask for better inspiration than that, closer to home. So, we've got the, the British title belt here um, against Rhys Mould in February. Uh, yep. Ninth <laughs> round knockout. I think I put a bet on t for you to finish him in the, in the, in the seventh. I think I actually you know. sent you an Instagram you know the correct. message saying uh, <laughs> knock him out in the, second, in the seventh. So, Food, foods on you. Um, yeah, just, just talk me through that, that fight. What a, what a great knockout and what, a, what an amazing, amazing yeah. experience. So, um, obviously, I've always wanted to win the British title since yeah. I was very, very young. I think I first held Nicky Booth's. Um, when I was young, but an awards even in the first year was here at Phoenix. We mm. had it at the Colton Police Station. Nicky brought his bow and I hold it. I've got a photo um, of a stick of ours. Since then, I've always wanted to win it. Watched Carl win it, um, a few others. So, yeah, 
obviously from my career I've had a shot here before I got beat. This time there's no way I was getting beat, no way. Um, I had a change of trainer at the time, went down to Essex with Ben, I was thinking, what am I doing? I'm eight weeks away from my fight, starting fresh pretty much. But I did rock up down there quite fit and ready. Um, but Ben, what a guy, um, best move I could have made, got me ready for the fight. Uh, like I said, like, there's no doubt, no matter where I was training, I was going to win that fight regardless, even if like, I had to get carried out. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, there's no way I was losing that fight. Um, but the way Ben trained me and the way we did things, he just made it easy and um, produced the win that I produced. What differentiates Ben from other boxing trainers? Because he is an elite boxing coach with a fantastic reputation, but what's the difference between a regular boxing coach and someone of, of Ben Davison's calibre? I think... I think it's the time, patience and effort he puts in. Um, he's on the job. So from morning till night till he sleeps, yeah, sometimes he hardly sleeps. He's, like, he's messaging me things at night before I go to bed. So I'd spot that day and I'm getting video clips through Lee Wiley, who he works with, and he say, send him this. Things he shouldn't be doing. Send him this, things he's doing well. Things I want to see him do from other fights. And they'll pick out things and say, this is how I want you to do this. Watch this guy do it. Have you watched it? Okay, watch it again. Have you watched it? Okay, watch it again. How many times have you watched it today? Et cetera, et cetera. And it's just the, the, how on the job he is. Like, you, if you can't, sometimes you think, God, I just want to break, like, get off my back. But because he's that way, there's no room for error. Um, the drills, thousands of times. There's snippets of that fight. I can pick out things what, where Reese Moore normally would tag you and then sell his best shots. And you see me do a little move or a movement where I've just notified what he'd done and I move back around to me to take centre again. But without knowing, you wouldn't know, but I've practised that a thousand times in camp because we've identified them strengths of his and, uh, and worked towards them. And that's what makes him so special, Ben. Um, the effort he puts in, the time and patience he puts into each individual, individual fight. Since I've been there, I've seen, seen it do it with Lee. I've seen it doing with Josh, which hasn't boxed yet. And he's exactly the same for every fighter. I know there was a lot of emphasis put on power shots in that fight. Um, did you always know you was going to get Reese out of there in the latter stages of the fight? Was that, was that the plan for, for yourself and Ben on the outset? Yeah, I, I'm not going to say the plan is to go out and knock him out because that's not a really great plan. But um, yeah, when I first went to the gym, Ben, he asked me the question, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And I said, well, my strengths are my punching power. And he said, and I said, my footwork, he went, <laughs> that's detrimental. Um, he said, your footwork is detrimental. But yeah, my fitness as well, um, as we identified in the camp. So yeah, the plan was to, in my eyes, I always knew I was going to get him out because everything we worked on, especially when it got close to the fight, I said in a lot of interviews, I'm going to get him out. There's no way he's going to hear the final bell. Um, but going into the fight, the plan was what we worked on with Ben is that all that power I've got is, is landing it because I spent a lot of my previous fights on the back foot, running away, well not running away, but skirting around, making people miss until the tire, then trailing my big shots. Whereas this time it was more of setting them shots up, setting traps, um, landing them big shots. And then I knew when they land that I don't think he's gonna be able to recover. And like, I think I, I, I was second gearing a lot in the early on in the fight. The first three rounds, I was just chipping away, getting him on the jab, um, making him, getting him used to different sides and making him miss, seeing his shots, what, what he likes throwing, what he likes countering off. And then eventually I come back after the third round and I think he said, I think I, he, put, he spent a lot Reese Moore in the third. And I come back to the corner and Ben gave me a bit of a drilling kind of thing because I won't move in. And I, I basically I thought, all right then, I'll put a few in. And fourth round, I come out, let my hands go a bit. Then he went down and then um, Ben in the corners, don't rush it, don't rush it. Just keep breaking him down. Cause I knew over time, if I keep breaking down, keep making a miss, them shots are going to be so much clearer to set up my power shots. And that's basically what, what happened. Um, I, I, can't, I fainted him onto a right hand and it rushed in for that body shot and boom. And that was pretty much the end of the fight. So now you're training at the MTK Performance Centre in Essex, you know, surrounded by some really good lads, Shabab Mavrik Masood, um, Josh Taylor, just to name a few. Um, how much value do they have, add to the party when you're training with these guys on a regular so basis? Much. So much value. Um, I spent a lot of time over the last few years training on my own. So sometimes I rock up to the gym doing pads on my own, doing a hard run on my own. Whereas down now in Essex, I'm training along 
Josh, who's got two world titles, hopefully soon, touch board, he's going to have all the belts. Um, obviously, Liam McGregor, European champion, British Commonwealth before, um, Shabazz Maksud, uh, Leo Delanger. So we're not all just training together, but we're living together as well. So we're in and out of uh, the same routine all the time. We're all eating well, we all can do the same things and can't do the same things. We can't go out and eat what we want. We can't have late nights. So yeah, it makes it a lot easier for myself because we're around a team pushing each other, getting the best out of each other. Someone gets a, a new score, a new speed on something on, on the, the curve or the circuits. I'm like, oh, you managed to do this many things in 20 minutes, this flat thing we're doing. Yeah, it's just constantly pushing the, pushing the bar and getting more out of yourself because we've got that competitive environment. In regards to competitive sparring, is it a case of you drafting in boxers from other gyms to fight and sparring sessions? Or do you guys, say, take for example, you spar Josh sometimes, sometimes you spar Shabazz. How does that work? Mm, yeah, so we do a lot of technical things together, uh, more drills and that, but we don't not lump off each other. We do a bit of body sparring between ourselves, but um, no, we don't, we don't whack each other. Um, sometimes we have to if we haven't got any sparring and we get let down, but it's just drills and, and things like that between ourselves and then we get sparring partners in from other clubs to uh, let our hands go kind of thing. So you're still managed by Dave Caldwell, yep. still getting trained by Ben Davison. Yep. Um, you won the British title in February. Uh, I'm sure there's many um, boxers that, that want a want a shot at that title and they want to take <coughs> it off your hands and dethrone you. I any so. um, any sort of um, bad blood on Twitter or Instagram? Anyone calling you out um, at the minute, Lee? No, not really, me. Um, not that I can think of. Louis Lynn said he wanted the fight after his fight. Um, I said basically get your management to ring Caldwell to fight, we could, we could make straight away. Um, we've not heard nothing. Um, look, anyone wants a shot here, I know what it's like sitting around waiting for fights. When I was at the Ingalls, you know, I was waiting for British title and kept getting promises, nothing happening. My, I've got open hands, like anyone wants a shot, get in touch, you can, you can have your shot kind of thing. I'd love to win that British title outright, uh, but it's got to have to be fast. Um, I'm not a spring chicken, so I've got to get cracking. I've got to get them in. I would like to defend it before the end of the year or earlier next year if I am defending it. But like I said, it's opened up a lot of doors. Um, could be European title next, could be pushing for a world title. So who knows what's next? But um, I won't be vacating it until I've got something set in stone or I win another belt for sure. So What's the, what's the blueprint for the remainder of the year then? Is there any updates on when you'll be fighting next at yeah, all? Yeah, so we're aiming for July. Um, a lot of the shows up in the air at the minute, you've got promoters pulling all kinds of strings and movements and channels swapping about. As you may know, we've, uh, you've seen the rumours about Matchroom and uh, Salon taking things over. So we're just going to sit around and wait. We're well, not sit around and wait, but we've got things in the making, but we're just going to wait, see how things pan out. Um, we're aiming for July to be back out. I know that you had a, a topsy-turvy year in 2020, um, the golden contract, <laughs> lost out to Jazza Dickens. Um, but you've come a long way um, since that point. You know, you're a better all-round boxer now, got good coaching staff. Good team. Good, good team. team. Um, would, would Jazza Dickens be in your sights for a future fight? I'm sure you'd want to avenge yeah, that loss. I'd like to put that right. Um, there's no, you're never going to get an easy night with Jazza Dickens, um, especially when you're not on it. And you can see my performance, I want on it, I want firing. Um, and I lost on a split and I boxed terrible, boxed terrible. So it's a fight I'd love to put right. Um, same with Gavin McDonald as well, like, I don't feel like I need that fight, but it would be nice to put the record straight um, and clean, clean that up off my, off, my, uh, off my record in his fight for the European title again soon, most more than likely just got a draw for it, so if they have a rematch, but it's all about time, that could take months and months and months, so we'll see where we're at. Um, like I said, I'd love to win that right, but if I ain't got time and it don't make sense, and it don't, but we'll see what happens. But if there was an opportunity to fight Absolutely. McDonald, Absolutely. You, you'd, you'd want to get in there and fight him and win that European title. Yeah, I mean, if he'd have won at the weekend, we could have made that fight for the British and European. It would be a massive uh, rematch and be a big fight, but now um, the clash of heads and it's the, they're rematching first, it's going to take time, so I don't know. You can't rule it out, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. So hypothetically, that fight did go ahead, this time around, what happens? What do you think? <laughs> what do you think happens? I have to remain impartial. <laughs> um, Gav Max is a good fighter. Mm. He's boxed for world titles. Uh, I do believe he'll win that European in the rematch and be a two weight or a European champion. Um, but I was at the wrong weight when I fought him the first time. No one believed me, everyone thought it was an excuse, but um, I will put the record straight 100%. And um, he's a very fit, 
fit fighter and he's very experienced, but I do believe I'd get him up. I mean, what a way to start 2021. Um, British champion and got an exciting remainder of the year ahead. Um, you must be absolutely overjoyed to have uh, won this belt. Um, how did it feel when you had it wrapped around your waist for the very first time on that um, night? When I first when I first got the stoppage, I was just immediately, it's weird, but immediately I felt so bad for Reese because I've been there myself. I was unbeaten back in 2014. I know what it feels like you had your insides ripped out. Of you. I knew what it feels like. And of course, it was a come some big shots. So like, obviously, I was, first of all, I didn't celebrate because I was thinking, I hope he's all right because I did land four or five, maybe six clean shots. So at first I thought, I hope he's all right. And then once I seen he was all right, then I thought, I remember being there, that's not nice. And then I was kind of thinking, right, sort your head out. You just want, you wanted to win this since you was 11 years old. You've had it in your hands, you know, like, and I thought, yeah, do you know what? Kind of sunk in and I was like, where's the crowd? <laughs> so it was like one thing to another, I was like, where's my fans? Where's my family? Where's all the people that have been there, like from Clifton Leisure Centre? I'm like, there's, there's, no, there's no crowd, you know? But yeah, like, it's one of them. All, the, all this time it's took to, to win it and then I've won it and there's no one, <laughs> there's no one there. <laughs> but no, I'm sure um, we'll get a defence or some, some bigger titles for the fans to be there. Everyone's seen it. But um, yeah, it was a special, still a special night. Um, and it won that probably be the best night of my career up to, to, to this date. I know Reese Moles just coming up, um, quite a young fighter as well. I know there's a little bit of needle before the fight, a little bit of bad blood in the bubble. Um, what, what was the conversations like after the it fight? It wasn't so much bad blood. Um, I think he took it as... He might have took it the wrong way because everything I said, I truly believed. Everything I, everything, every single thing I said, I truly believed. And every single thing I said, I went out and did. I knew what I'm going to do with the distance. I thought pushed me for a prediction and I said round 9 or 10. But just because of the fact that most of my stoppages have been in them just at the early start of them championship rounds. So... Everything I did say, I, I went out and did. Um, he he reacted off what I said. So it, when he heard that I said, "Oh, you won't know the final bell," he probably talk, t took it as, "Oh, he's being disrespectful and he's shouting his mouth." But I was that confident in my ability and his inexperience. That's why I said it. So then, obviously, he heard that and he said, "It's going to be an early night for me." And I think he was just saying it in retaliation. So not so much bad blood, but you know, sometimes it's good to build a fight because the more views you get, the better for our profiles. But everything I, truly, everything I said was hand on heart. What I believe was going to happen and is what happened. So. I can always remember the first Lee Wood fight that I went to was at Clifton Leisure Centre. And you, you walked out to uh, Jake Bug, Lightning Bolt, <laughs> wearing a, a cowboy hat. You, you've, cut, you've, cut, you've come a long way since that, that moment, Lee. Yeah, I always try to uh, involve this city or fly the flag, you can say, for the city. So back then it was the Sheriff of Nottingham just wanted to do something different. Now it's a Robin Hood theme at the minute. Mm. I think that might stick because I just think like the, the rich Nottingham green of like Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest and things, it sells all over the world. Every, everywhere I've been, I've been to Mexico and people say, where are you from? And I say Nottingham and they say, not heard of it. And I say Robin Hood, mm. oh yeah, Robin Hood. So things associate uh, the cities with major, major events, major things, um, folklore and stuff. So. Yeah, I think that traditional green for me on a kit is kind of gives me a bit of identity. So the Robin Hood thing and kind of tied it in with, with my boxing and um, try and fly, fly the flag for the city. I know Clinton was mentioned to me off, off set that you, you're still very much involved with the amateur scene. That you come to a lot of the, the lo local shows for Phoenix as well and the grassroots oh, yeah. of boxing. It's very important to you, Lee. I tried to get to Clinton's shows. Uh, at the Liberal Club, obviously with COVID and that, we've not had some for a while, but I'm sure when he's allowed, he'll be back there and I would love to come down again. I enjoy it, I enjoy watching the, uh, the transformation of the younger generation come through. You see him as juniors, then you see him as seniors, and then you start to think, oh, I, might, I think he might do all right. And some, the one, sometimes you pick the one, you think, oh, he's gonna do good, and then they kind of fade off, and the ones that wasn't so good kind of take over and come through. So it is good to watch uh, the kids progress and make the transition into senior, then hopefully professional fighting and um, watch the journeys and be a part of it. Where would you like to be? And where can you see yourself 12 months down the line, May 2022? Right, so in a, in a year, just under, I would like to have either won this outright, so um, 
my kids can trash it. <laughs> no, I'd like to win this outright so I can pass it down to my grandkids and have it in the family, you know? It's something that, um, I think when you win a British title outright, it does make you more of a household name. Well, not so much household anymore, but it does cement your name uh, in boxing a bit more. Froch, Brooke, um, you know, just to name a few that I've been a part of, to kind of boost the profile and it kind of solidifies you at that level. But even though, like, Every domestic fight I've been in, I've won by knockout. Commonwealth, Commonwealth Defence, WWE European, British title, they've all been knockouts. But I think until you win one outright and you beat who the board says you have to beat, then you, that's pretty much, you've ticked, ticked that box, you've, you've cleared up at that level. So I would like to do that um, by next year, if I can. If that route doesn't happen for whatever reason, there may be a world title shot on the horizon. So. Either get me in line for one or fight for one by May, or being well, I win one. So that's where I'd like to be next year. Obviously, there could be other routes, but them two, either either of them two, would be the best ones for me. And what's the, what's the dream for you? What's the final end goal for you? Um, what's the pinnacle of your career before you <laughs> wrap up, Lee? So I said a few months ago that there was three things I wanted to achieve in my career, not in any order, obviously, but in the order, this order, which is starting to fall into place bit by bit, was win the British title. So that one's ticked. The second one would probably tie in with the third one, that's Box for World title, because Brendan Ingle used to say to me all the time, if you don't box a World title, it'd be a travesty. Um, he said, you'll win British Commonwealth, European, and hope to God I see it, you'll win a World title. Um, obviously, he's not here anymore, so I need to go and fight for that World title. Hopefully win one, you know. Um, and obviously the third thing is fight at the, the Forest Ground, be the first person to headline at the City Ground. And it gives me goosebumps thinking about it, but it, it would be a massive, a massive show. I'd love to be the first person to do that. Frutch obviously did a lot for the City. He went in and won numerous world titles. Uh, I don't know if you know, but he had, boxed in front of 80,000 people. Oh and, really? Uh, and, um, I didn't know that. You know, but to give myself uh, as a fight in my own identity with the City as well, the first person to do that would be will be incredible and um, I think it's going to happen, I think I can do it and them two, the world title and that will probably tie in together or at least a final eliminator or something along them lines so yeah that's what I want to achieve in my career and hopefully, hopefully it will happen. I think it's fair to say that now you've secured the British title um, at, at the time and in, in the age that you are, you've made it a distinct possibility now Lee, would you say? Yeah, like I said when I won that uh, British title on the night, it opened so many doors especially because I've won other belts as well, but now the British is, is the main one that gives you um, a lot of clout, they say, um, the British title. So, yeah, it opens up a lot of doors. I've got a lot of possibilities. Sometimes people jump from, world title, uh, from British titles to world titles or, or eliminators and world titles, so it opens a lot of doors. It gives you a good ranking. I think I'm top 13 in the world or top 12 in the world or something like that, so... Yeah, I'm on a lot of world champions' radar now. I'm in um, contention. Just the organisations are different, but you're only a fight away from getting in, getting a shot, getting in their top five. So we'll see what happens. Like I said, I'd love to win that outright, but if not, we can go um, choose a world title. I'm not going to moan. Do we need to be keeping our eyes peeled for a fight date? Is there going to be some type of announcement in the not too distant future? Yeah, definitely. I think we'll be announcing something in May, around May time, end of May. So watch this space. Watch your space. Good stuff. Lee, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you today. Thanks for coming on to Tough Boxing TV. Always on the a road. pleasure. Always a and, pleasure. And um, we'll, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, mate. Cheers.